All right, yeah, welcome to the interactive system programming presentation and session. We will focus today on C++ game programming, but I will also cover the general concepts of what involves the programming itself. So even if you're not a programmer, you will still learn the concepts the programmer will talk about, right? So you still have an understanding of what this sort of stuff means. I'm Alexander. I'm a software engineer here since three years. My main responsibilities in the engine are the entity system, which I will cover, game systems in general, and the templates, which we will touch on later. First, we will cover the game plugin. The game plugin is the starting point of our game where you can start to program. We will cover entities because they're the core part of game programming and anything in the world in CryEngine. Then we will cover components, how you can compose entities with components, and how you can build logic with components. Then we will cover a little bit input, like how do you do input, how do you get input from the engine. Then we will cover physics. Uh, we will go over how can you simulate objects in the engine and how can you trigger specific things, how can you apply impulses and those sort of topics. Then we will cover shortly Flowgraph. This will be just like a pre-version for the programmer so you can write your own notes for the visual sort of scripting. Right, and then the last topic will be debugging and sort of debugging drawing. This will be just a quick way to show you like how can I test stuff in my project and like some tips and tricks to make your life easier. Yeah, the same goes for console variables and CVAS. This is the same thing. It's for how to use the inbuilt console in the engine and how to expose values to it. So what is the game plugin? The game plugin is generally the starting point of the engine. The engine can load as many plugins as it wants to. The game is just another plugin, but it's a special one because it encapsulates all the game logic. For example, you could also write a plugin for, I don't know, a weather system, for example, which would be then encapsulated for a game system, so you can be, it can be reused for uh, other things. Right, so how to implement a game plugin. So I will cover most of the stuff here from the rolling ball sample. As you can see, here's the solution of our project. You can see that here on the side, we have the game itself as a project. And you can already see there are two files in here, the game plugin header and CPP. Those files are the starting point of your engine. This is the very first thing which will be called on game start. Most of our logic you program is done through interfaces. So the engine exposes interfaces and those interfaces can be used in C++. So if we, for example, see here our game plugin is the entry point and it inherits from our interface engine plugin. So this sort of in interface gives you all the functionality you can provide to the engine to sort of build your, your game. For example, the only really thing which uh, will be called the first time is the initialize. And this is the first starting point where you actually will start your game programming. So in the initialize, you can start your game. You can do whatever you want in here. This is pretty much the entry point of your plugin. You can, for example, initialize your players or you can start to do any sort of logic you want to do. So this is the starting point uh, of the engine. The plugin also provides uh, a little bit more functionality for you to use, but in generally, generally this is it. It just needs to inherit from the engine plugin. It will compile into a DLL, and this DLL is loaded by the engine. So as you can see, we, we called it rolling ball. That's our game plugin, and we overrided some functions, right? So this is how you generally implement a game plugin. Then there are three concepts, the initialization, which I already talked about. This is where you can start to program your logic and to build whatever you want to build. Then you have the system events. Those are events you get from the CryEngine for specific things happening in the engine. So if we have a look on the system event, it's one generic function where you get information from the engine. So we have a lot of systems events. There can be anything. There could, for example, be event changed focus. So let's say you have your game open. Someone taps out of the game. Uh, and you want to handle, you want to pause the game, you want to do something specific, then you can use those events to react to things happening in the engine. The same goes for resize. We also know, for example, when the level loaded, when we know when it starts to load, when it ends to load. So here you can use those events to implement specific logic for your game. You can start, for example, to initialize the player when the level loads, or you can start to show specific UI elements when level is loading. So those sort of system events you can use in your game to build logic and react to engine related problems. And as you can see, all those things are exposed through the interfaces and they're all commented as well. So we'll always understand what those things do. Right, then the other topic is updates. So you need updates in your game. You want to do something every frame, right? You want to move something. You want to update your weather system to simulate clouds or those sort of things. You, so you therefore need to update your game logic. 
and the plugin already provides that logic for you as well. So as you can see, we have multiple entry points for updates in the game plugin. We have update before system, before physics. We have the main update, which is the normal main update you would expect to have. You just, it just ticks every frame. But let's say you have want to do something before physics starts to simulate. You can do this in here. For example, there might be cases where you have an object which should, should already be moved before the physics system starts to simulate it. So those sort of things can be done through here. As you can see, it's all as well documented in the code already, so you can understand what it uses. And you can just override them in here, in your own class, in the game plugin. And then it will just automatically be called by the engine once it's loaded. Right. So this is the game plugin. So I, I guess you have a rough idea what it does, what it's used for. So we will go now further to the entities, which are like the core essential part of the engine and gameplay programming. So let's talk first about what is an entity. So there's no specific use case for an entity. It's just the game object which you can plug in any logic into it. It just has a position in the world. So if we start, for example, the engine, I can show you how the entity looks like in the editor. And then we will uh, have a look how it looks like in the code. So let's say uh, we open the sandbox. And we already probably covered the create object tab. And you already have here one empty entity category here. And if you click it, you can already drag in this entity into the scene. Now this entity is in the scene. And as you can see, if I disable the helpers, there's nothing. Like th there's just a concept, right? The entity doesn't really exist as a mesh or something in the scene. It's just a concept where this object lives. So in here, we have this entity. It has some generic information. So the entity can have a name. So we can name this like whatever we want. And you can see that in the, in the level explorer, it will get this name. But it still has no logic to it. It just lives in the scene. It can also be moved, as you can see with the transformation here. It has a position, rotation, and scale. And this is pretty much the only thing the entity really saves for you. All the rest of the information will be plugged in from Flowgraph or all the other subsystems into this entity. And the entity is sort of the container for all of this logic. But it itself, the entity just stores transformation, the names, and those sort of things. So there are some interactions you can do with entities just by themselves. So you have entity links. And entity links are just conceptual links between entities. So I can go to the linking tool here, have one entity in the scene, and I can pick other entities in the scene. As you can see, it highlights on the cursor that I can link other objects here. Now I have a link, and this link has no effect on the meshes, has no effect on the transformation. It's just a sort of concept of that those entities have a relationship to each other. And you can also give that relationship a, a name. Like, for example, this could be just some name or whatever you want to visualize with this link in your logic, you can use this. So for example, a really typical example would be you have a generator somewhere in your game. And this generator is just entity linked to multiple lamps or lights in the scene, right? And once someone runs to that generator, presses the start button, you can just look through all the links and just say, this light goes on, this light goes on, this light goes on. They have a relationship, right? They have no like real direct like hierarchy, but they have a relationship. And that's what those entity links can be used for. And those entity links can also be used in code. So you can query them in code, and you can use them to sort of build anything. So for example, you could also build sort of like a track where you have entities following each other with links, or those sort of things. You can model a lot of concepts with this already. Right, so this is the entity link. The entity link is just on a theoretical basis. There's no impact on transformation or anything in the scene directly. But the other thing you can do is you can still put them into a hierarchy. So you can drag and drop objects together to create a hierarchy. This hierarchy now means that those entities, they move together, right? This entity here is a child of this entity. They are now not just conceptually linked, but they are also linked on a hierarchical base, right? Those are just the two differences uh, which should be clear because it can be a little bit confusing because those two things exist. The hierarchy itself can also be created in code and can also be removed in code. So you can do pretty much anything you can do in the sandbox with the entities also in code, obviously. So those are the entities. I will have a real quick look into the code just so you already get like an idea how they look like. So the I entity, this is the very interface of every entity in the scene. It's one class, it's one interface of all the entities in the scene. And as you can see as well in the interface, we have public functions. This entity exposes to you in code. And those functions are all documented. So for example, we have a get ID. 
And this ID of the entity is one specific identifier for this entity. So if we go back to the editor, we have the entity here. And this is a unique entity, right? It is identified through this identifier. And this identifier can be used to check entities. So for example, you have one entity and another one. And you want to compare if they're the same or if they're not the same. You can just use the identifier and see, OK, is it the same thing or not? And this identifier will, can also be used to get an entity from the system itself. But I will show this later. Then we have a GUID. Uh, maybe you already know what GUID means. It's a global unique identifier. And this identifier is even unique for multiple runs. So let's say you want to save an entity to, a, to the disk or an information about an entity to the disk. You would rather use the GUID because the GUID is a 16-bit information about this very specific entity. And it's also unique per run. So yeah, you can see you have multiple functions. I just want to cover some uh, basic ones. So for example, you have a function where you can get the name of an entity. It's the same name you can put into the entity in here. So let's say maybe you just want to print the name of an entity doing something. All those things are exposed through the entity. You can attach childs, you can detach childs, you can get the children, the parent. Pretty much everything you would expect from an entity which can be done in the sandbox can also be done in code. For example, I think uh, IntelliSense can help you a lot with like what you can do with it, right? It's just, okay, let's use the play entity here, uh, down here. So we already have a play entity here in general. And you can just see, oh, IntelliSense already gives me a lot of options. And we can already see things which we already covered. Add entity link. So all those things you can do in the sandbox can also be done in code. So yeah, how do you create entities? As we've shown, we already have one way to create entities. That's in the sandbox. You just drag them in, save the level, you have entities. But you can also create entities in code, in your game plugin. So if you, let's say you have a character and he shoots bullets, those bullets are most likely entities and they sh should move. So you need to spawn them dynamically. And spawning dynamically is uh, very easy. You just invoke the entity system. We have the GNV, which is a global environment, right? And in here, we have the m different systems. So the entity system is just one of the many systems. And the entity system already gives you the option to spawn entities. And it just expects some parameters from you. And th those might look a little bit daunting at the beginning. Like they have some positions in those. But all of this is optional. You can literally just spawn an empty entity without any information given. But obviously, you can also tell it, oh, yeah, spawn at this position, with this rotation, with this name, and so on and so forth. So that's how you generally create entities. Then let's talk a little bit about, uh, about the members of the entity and the slots. An entity itself has some very basic members. So it's just set up of an entity. It's just nice to know that it has those in case you need oh, the text is so large. As you can see, there's also a lot of functionality in that entity, so you can do a lot with it. Yeah, and generally, the entity has one transform for world transform. So what does that mean? World transform means it's the actual transformation of this one specific entity in the world, right? Uh, there's no local transform involved into that. The entity as well has also a local transform, so you can get either of those. The local would, for example, in this case, be the linked object is, has a local transformation to this global object, right? It's relative to its parent. And, that, and this information can also be obtained by the entity. The entity stores both of those informations because they can be handy. Then the entity obviously stores the name, the links, and also some flags. So if you want to specifically tell the entity properties, they are exposed through flags. What are flags? Flags in general are just options. It's like a checkbox, more or less, for properties of this entity. So for example, an entity can have cast shadows. So you can tell this entity, please cast shadows or don't cast shadows. And I will don't cover all the flags because uh, you most likely don't need all of them, but it's just good to know that they exist so you can have a look uh, when you need something specific. So for example, you can also tell the entity to not save to disk or to uh, don't send events and those sort of things. Or for example, if you don't want the entity re to receive it. All those things are documented and also are found in the documentation pages. So yeah, we covered uh, most of the stuff from the entity. I think you kind of have a concept what the entity does and what it's used for. And then one very uh, important part about entities is that the entity is a container for components, right? I think most people are probably like familiar with an entity component system, but I will explain it uh, really briefly. So this entity now li lives in the scene, but it has like no properties. There's no mesh, nothing. But now I can compose this entity with components. I can add components here in the property view and just add as you can see, we have a lot of default components already exposed with the engine. And if I just want to mesh, 
I can click it here, and now you see, okay, now this entity has a mesh, right? The entity is still only the entity, but it now got a component plugged into it, and this component can have any logic. In this case, this component is a mesh, right? So this mesh exposes properties like what file should it have. This, this component also has, again, a transformation where I could move my entity around. So let's say the entity, as you can see, still didn't move, but the component transformation moved the mesh. And as you can see, all the parameters are exposed from the component. And for example, you see you have a mesh here. And let's say, oh yeah, I want another mesh. It's no problem. You just add a new mesh to it. So the, it's just composing the entity with whatever you need. You can build a extremely complex entities, but they can also be really simple. It doesn't matter. And as you can see, we also have uh, some things. I won't go over all of them, but you, for example, have particle emitter, you have lights, you have physics. So in general, let's say you want just a, a ball that rolls around in the level, it's pretty straightforward. You create a mesh, you just added a mesh component. Now you can see that it has a mesh to it, but if I start to simulate physics, which is up here, nothing happens, right? Like, let's say this would not interact with my, my rolling ball here, right? It's, it doesn't even collide with it because it's just a mesh. It's just render geometry, but it doesn't know physics. Like physics has no relationship to this entity right now. So what we can do is we can add a rigid body to it which is just a way to tell physics, please simulate this object. And we can also give it specific properties on how to simulate this object. But just adding it by default should already work. There you go. You have the entity, the entity moves with the mesh, and the physics simulates it. So I can collide with the object, it can be moved around. And for example, you can give it different values like a high mass value. And now it will be harder for me to push this object, like because it's heavier, so it's harder for me to push it away. So those things are all exposed through those component values, and it's just playing around with them. If you get used to them, you just see what they do, and you can figure most of the stuff already out just, just by playing around with them. So components, obviously, can also be created in code. So you can create your own components. And actually, all those components you find in this panel here are from the engine, right? They are exposed from the engine, but you can have a look at them. They're all in the, uh, on the public source, right? You can just have a look. Uh, hey, how did they implement this mesh component? I want to do the same. You can just go there and look it up. And it's, it all follows the same uh, rule set. So yeah, let's cover some really simple component. We will later on then together build a custom component because the components are pretty much the major way you build logic, right? You just, for example, build a component for a player, which calculates the score. And it's just a component, a score component, for example. And then the score component does logic. So for example, in here you see, again, we inherit from an interface from the engine, the identity component. And in this thing, the only relevant option here is the reflect type. And I guess this is kind of different to other engines, but this reflect type is just a function where you describe this component. Because somehow we need to get information from your game code to the sandbox and to the editor. So for example, in Unity, they have those C-sharp attributes, which you can use. And for example, in Unreal, they do a passing step. But you still have those macros to expose specific things. And then here, we have our own function. And this function uh, lets you set descriptions. So for example, you can set a description editor category, which just will place it into a specific editor category in here. So for example, I already created this my component. It's my very special component. And it's in here. You can see, oh, OK, it has a name. It is listed in the game category. And that's pretty much it. The rest you can do with it is pretty much up to you. It's just a container for you to program logic. And you can interact with the entity at any time. So for example, one step is the process event. And this is kind of similar to the event processing from the game plugin, where you get information about, oh, did the level load it, or what happened in the engine. This is an event on entity, on entity level. So you can see you have entity events which tell you this entity just transformed, like it changed its, its transform in the scene. Oh, I, maybe I need to update my logic. Or let's say, oh, it was removed. Hmm, maybe I should do something if the entity was removed. Because there could be a, a logic in your game where a bullet hits something, the object get removed, you need to react to it. Same goes for attachment, link edit, unhidden, those sort of things. All those events are sent to you, and you can react to them how you please. So yeah, this is pretty much the concept of components and how we use them. We will later on build our own component and interact with like objects in the scene, so build some game logic. Then we already touched this a little bit briefly, but it's just 
how do you use the entity system? Because entities is just an instance, right? The entity is an instance in a scene, but the entity system is the overall system which manages all those entities. And all those entities, which are on here, for example, right now, those entities, they are now in the entity system. And the entity system is sort of the manager of all those entities. So every time you don't know, or you don't have an entity, or you don't know information about an entity, it's probably a good place to look in the entity system itself for information. So for example, uh, if we go back to this example, as, as we already said, the GNV gives us, exposes all the system, and we want to see what the entity system can do for us. For example, one really simple thing is just give me an entity. Just give me this entity with this ID. So for example, in here, I can just give it an ID I have from somewhere. I will touch how you get those IDs later. But in general, you have this ID, you can just get the entity itself and then do something with it. Or for example, let's say you don't even know the ID because you don't have it right now. You can also find an entity by name and those sort of things. And all those things are exposed uh, through the entity system. You can also obviously remove entities. You can tell the entity system, this entity should be removed. I don't need it anywhere. For example, you have a bullet. It did its job. It hit the enemy. He got damage. Now just get rid of this entity because it's not needed anymore. The entity system sort of gives you this functionality. You can also find those entity on layer base. So you see, I, I have a layer here, and this layer is just like a logical combination of all those objects in the scene. And the entity system is aware of those layers. So the layers are exposed, and you can just like ask, oh, give me all the entities in my layer, I don't know, gameplay logic or something like that. And that's also a nice way to clean up your scenes and to sort of have specific logic or specific entities and specific layers to make your life easier if you need to get or query ent entities. OK, now you can pr program components. You have your entities. Now I want to actually have the player do something, right? Because the player needs to give input so we can react to it in the game and what we want to build. The input is handled in multiple ways. The most exposed way, I would say, are action maps. And action maps, just so you heard that term, are sort of descriptions of how your input should be mapped. Because let's say you have like a really complex game where the player has a vehicle controls, but he has also controls when he's not in the vehicle, right? And you don't want to build like crazy if statements and like conditions where, oh yeah, if he's in a vehicle, but he's not in the vehicle and does this and this. So a really easy way to do this is in the libs under config. Uh, so assets, libs, config, it can be anywhere, but it's just where it lives by default. You have a default profile XML or generally just the action map profile. And then here, you can firstly define platforms. So you can say, oh, I want to have this for keyboard, Xbox, and PS4 pads. So all the, the inputs are the same. And you can describe them. There's, so for example, you can have an action map for players. You can have an action map for, I don't know, menu. You can have an action map. Action map is just a combination of inputs you want to map, right? So action map could be anything. It's just a combination out of different map inputs. For this example, where I can move around with my rolling ball, it's just, OK, I can move around with uh, W, A, S, D, and with space, I can jump. So for example, in this case, it's just, OK, move left. It's just mapped to the keyboard A, D, W, S. The m mouse rotation, yaw, and pitch is just mouse X is X and Y. And those information will then be directly transferred to your code where you can interact with them. There's a really nice documentation page about action maps. So if you want to like look it up again, because I'm not going to go through and write the whole XML file with you. The concept is, uh, I think, clear. And I will show how it will be used in code. The action maps are really nice. And you can also have a look in the game SDK example how like a really complex action map could look like. So how does it look in code? How do you get those events? We have a component for input in the player in here. So if we scroll down to the members, you can see that we have an input component. And this input component is just there for you for ease of use. It exposes already all those sort of action map logic behind it. So for example, the registering action of the first move left. So the input component gives you, lets you register actions, as we talked about already in the action map. And we called it move left. It's for the player action map. And in here, I mean, this code is probably uh, looks more difficult than it actually is. It is just a lambda. It's just a function call, right? It's just a callback. So every time in here, the register action, you could just give it a function pointer or any sort of callback system and handle it. You can also build your own event system around it. It's all up to you. But in general, it's just a callback you can use. And this is how you can use it. You can also directly talk to the action map manager directly. If you feel like, oh, I don't want to deal with this input component. I want to build my own system around action maps. Uh, you can, as always, search for a GNV 
the game framework encapsulates the action map manager and the action map manager is again just an interface which exposes functions to you which you can then use to like do whatever you want you can load them you can save them you can create them at runtime pretty much anything you want to do with them so that's generally how the input system works and setting up the action maps is normally just you take an already existing xml file action map and you just add new lines to it you just say like okay i want like a new line here so i just add a new action I give it the name, right, jump. Then I, I can tell it, oh, should it be on press or released? And then I just add a space key for it, for example. And what those things mean, they're all documented. So you get a documentation list of all the keys which are available, like, for example, on the, the mouse or on the keyboard or on the different controllers. The next big part is physics, because we already kind of touched on physics how entities get physics, but physics obviously is its own complete system in the background as well. Like you can do anything you could imagine with physics in the background with it. And this was just the very beginning. So as we said, the entity here in our example got the rigid body. It has multiple options. It can, for example, rest, which means that the entity will not move until it's touched. So let's say you have a barrel somewhere or like a, I don't know, just a normal box in your game world and it should be interactable but it should not start to simulate directly at the beginning because it would look silly if the box already starts to like move around when you jump into the game. So the resting option is just that. So for example, if I put this on resting and jump into the game, you see, oh, it, it doesn't simulate, it's on hold. And once I touch it, it starts to simulate. And this resting option uh, is really important for two reasons. First of all, it saves you a lot of performance. Like let's say you have a huge scene with a lot of objects which should be simulated but you only care about them once the player interacts with them, right? Because you don't care about this like trash can sitting in the corner. It doesn't need to be simulated until the player actually interacts with it. So that's why resting is really important. And it also helps to control what actually is moving in a scene and what's not. Then the next option we have here is rigid and static. This gen generally just means that if I have something static, it's just a static collider in the scene. It cannot move. It's just there to sort of have collision, right? So normally in a game, most of the objects are just static, right? You just walk around, you have meshes everywhere, like you have a corridor, for example. You don't want that the whole corridor simulated with gravity. You just want to walk through and have collision. That's why you have those two different options. Then we have like more advanced things, which I won't touch in detail, but those are as well documented. Like buoyancy generally just says how this object behaves in water or air. So for example, you want to build something which actually like rises in water or goes down, uh, you can define it in the, in the buoyancy par parameters. And the simulation parameters are just for you to specify how detailed the simulation of this very object should be. Like let's say you have a rigid body and it's really important for your game for some whatever reason, you can increase the maximum time step so it gets more simulation, like it gets calculated more often in a game, right? And through this system, you can make sure that, for example, I mean, maybe everyone already had this in a game, right? You walk somewhere and all of a sudden you fall through the ground or you fall, you, you clip into an object, although it should have physics. And normally this happens because if you have a frame drop or something, the calculation cannot keep up with the movement of the player and you just move sort of into the collision. But if you increase the time step, this object should have a more detailed simulation than other objects. But obviously you shouldn't do this for all the objects because it will be taxing, it will cost it will decrease your frame rate. Then we, will, we can cover a little bit more general physics things we can do here. So you can see, oh, there's actually a lot of physics. And yeah, there's a lot of different paths in physics. Uh, I will go over them quickly just so you know what you can do with it. Uh, we already had a rigid body, right? And it, the rigid body automatically uses the mesh as a collider, right? Because the mesh, if you import it, you can set proxies and this will be automatically used. But if you want to add a new collider, just a conceptual collider, right? Just it should not be connected to the asset. It's just something I want in my scene because I need that it collides with it. So for example, now I can see that the debug draw helper here, when I click on the entity, it will show me, ah, okay, there's also this imaginary box sort of. Uh, and if I put this back on rigid, so it actually does something uh, and maybe not resting, so we also automatically falls down. You can see that uh, it now has this collider, right? Like. It uses it, although there's no mesh. It's just the physics system knows, OK, this box is also a collider, so I need to simulate this box and the mesh. And they are like you can com completely build this in any way you can imagine. So the mesh, for example, also gives you the option to decide if the mesh should render and collide, or only render or collide. 
so for example, uh, if you if you set it up in a way that it just renders, you actually just have to adjust the box, and that's it. Like the mesh doesn't attack with it anymore. And this also obviously is all exposed in code in general. So this is the box collider. Not really much more to it. It's pretty straightforward. We have obviously more sort of different types of colliders for physics. We have capsule colliders, cylinder colliders, and all those colliders are primitives. Like a, a sphere is a primitive, right? You cannot build like a com you cannot use like complex meshes in here because it will be more in intensive to calculate those collisions. And you can most of the times model anything in your game with just primitives, right? And if you want to specifically have the proxies in the mesh, you can already do it with this option here, where you can decide if it should uh, render and collide. Then physics gives you more. We have cloth, which is just what it says. You can define cloth objects. So you can, uh, let's say you want to just have a flag in your game, and you can have this cloth object just simulating wind effects on cloth or interaction with player. Like, OK, let's say an object moves through the cloth, it will just interact with it. Then we have also some logic for sort of vehicle physics or just in general like vehicle setups. We have thrusters for constant adding of velocity. We have vehicle physics and we all have tutorials for how this physical setup is used and it will be linked in the documentation. But I will not touch every single thing because I can talk about physics for hours <laughs> probably because there's a lot of stuff you can do with it. Right, then one also really uh, amazing system in CryEngine for physics uh, are constraints. You can constrain any object in the scene, how it should behave physically. Like I think everyone already had this when you build your game. You want that the object doesn't move somewhere or it only moves in a specific way, right? Or it's just pinpoint to this location, but it still can like do physical interactions. So for example, I have my object here, right? It's simulated and I can add a point constraint, which means this object is constrained to this position in the scene and it cannot move away from it. So as you can see, okay, it's constrained now, although it is rigid, it doesn't allow me to move it away, right? And the same goes, for example, for, for the line constraint, which is probably a little bit more interesting. So you can see that line, you already get a small debug helper, and this debug helper here in yellow shows you where this line lives. So let's say, build this thing. So generally, the, the line constraint can be used, for example, for let you know they, those saloon doors you have in like Western movies where they swing, but they only lock to this rotation, right, on one specific axis. That's why, where you can use those uh, constraints for. So yeah, there you see it. So now the object can only move, I, like I can track it as much as I want. It will only keep stationary in this specific line you set up here. So for example, you can also increase the limits. So you can, for example, say, okay, it should go further down. And then if I simulate again, you see it falls down to this very specific point. And this concept is really powerful. Like you can constrain pretty much any entity in the world if it has physics. So you can constrain objects to hands with constraints. So for example, if you have like some sort of attachment for a weapon, it can just be constrained. It is still physicalized calculated. So let's say you have some sort of object swinging around on your weapon. It's just, I don't know, like a, a magazine just being not completely plugged in and it just swings around. And it's still physicalized. It's calculated, but you don't need to deal with it. You just tell the physics system how this object is constrained. And that's all to it. You can also see that, that you can lock the rotation or not, that, that it depends on if you need it or not. You can lock the constraint or not. And you can set the axis of how this thing looks should move like. So you can define the axis of the line, right? So in this case, for example, it moves down that way. So for example, if you have some sort of train system or you have, I don't know, some physical interaction where you just want to have it one specific way, it's a really easy way to make sure that this object only moves in a way but still interacts with all the other physical objects in the scene. Then the next step of this thing is the plane constraint. Let's build a new entity. So the, the plane constraint is nice if you want to constrain it just to one specific plane in the scene. So let's say you want to do something in 2D or you want to have something uh, moving around on one plane in, two, like in a sort of 2D way but still interact with the different objects. So OK, so yeah, so in general, those things can also be all done in code, right? So all those objects can be spawned in code, and you can interact with them in code. So I can show you how that generally looks like. If you go to, for example, the initialize of the player, the entity obviously is the container for all of this logic. The physics is plugged in into the entity, and the entity lets you physicalize or like sort of do anything with physics. So in this case, we have our MP entity, which is 
an entity pointer. It's just our entity interface, which we already shown earlier. And in this interface, we can physicalize the object and do anything with physics in here. So like physicalize in general means explain how this object should be simulated. So physicalize just tells the physics system the properties of this entity. So in general, you can see that there are like density mass options, there are stiffness and those sort of like, there's a lot of like physical terms, but you don't need to set all of them. It's just the ones you need, you can set the rest you can leave behind. So for example, if we look at this specific example for our player, as we know, we have our player here. It is just a rolling ball and how you achieve that just through code are just those four lines. You just tell the entity physicalize with the type rigid and you tell the entity to have the mass of a specific value, right? And this then gets pushed to the physics system and it will be handled by physics in the background. Once your entity is physicalized, because not enti all the entities are physicalized, right? We already showed this that you can just have a mesh. There's no physics involved, so the entity has no physics. So once the entity is physicalized, you can access the sort of called physical entity. And the physical entity is just the counterpart of the normal entity in the physics world. So if we go back to this ball, it now has an entity in the scene with this mesh and the physics world also knows about this entity and that's what this physical entity means. It's just sort of the counterpart in the physics world. And with this physical entity, you can interact with the physics world. You can tell this physics entity to do whatever you want, right? You can tell it to apply impulse. So in generally, what you would do after you physicalize the entity, you would just have this physical entity and just work with it. So I, one, one really simple example is the jumping. We have a ball, we roll around, and we want to give it an impulse, right, to go up in the game. So like, I, normally I just, I'm just simulated now, but if I have input on my keyboard, it should do something, it should uh, react to this. So what that means is go real quick to the jump function. It's also very simple. This is just uh, the part which is relevant for us right now. As we said, we take our entity, we get our physical part of this entity, and then we can tell the entity to give it physical actions. And the physics system exposes a lot of different structures. So if we have a look at this file, it's from the physics interface exposed. And you can already see that there's a, there are a lot of like different exposed things from this interface which can be used. But let's keep with the impulse here for a second. The P action impulse is just a structure which physics gives you and you just feed it with information. You just tell, tell this physics struct, okay, you will have the impulse of this, you have, will have an angular impulse at which point it should be applied and all those things can be feed into the struct. It's just containing data. You just tell it what should happen. And then the only thing you need to do is just tell the physical entity action. And action is just a generic function where you can feed in any sort of functionality or action structures from the physics system. So in this case, we just say, okay, we have an impulse. We put the impulse on a specific vector, like a vector just like up for us, which is like 0, 0, 3, uh, 800, which just means the entity should just go up. And then we just tell the physical entity, do what I just said, and it will simulate the whole thing through the, through the game. And there are a lot of different actions. So if you, for example, you can add constraints. As we already said, this is what the component is already exposed here, right? The, the plane constraint exposes all those values in a probably nicer way for non-programmers, but it's still the same thing in the back end, right? So if you want to have a look how this works, you can just have a look on how the line constraint component or the plane constraint component does it and just have a, have a look how you need to feed in the data in here. And there's like a lot of stuff in here, as you can see. But for example, some, some things are also really, really straightforward. If you was, want to set the velocity of your object, you just want to specifically say this is the velocity of the object moving in a scene. Velocity just means the, the speed of the object, right? Like now it has a specific velocity in a specific direction. And this velocity can be set uh, through the action set velocity. And those sort of things all exist in physics. And if you once get used to it, it is pretty nice to use because you know where you need to go. You just go to the physics interface. You just search for the different actions. And we have documentation for those different structs, what they do. And you can see they're also all documented in code here as well. Like it tells you what it does. There are also ways where you can just have the PE status. So status is just something you get from the system. 
and the action is something where you give it to the system. Like action means system do something and status means give me a status, right? So the, the status can be anything. If you, for example, just want to know where is this entity right now in the physical world, you can just say position, it gives you the position. It can, for example, give you, oh, what's actually the current state of the constraints of this physical entity? can also just you you can use the status constraint you can also get the velocity like let's say you have a bullet hitting some object and you want to know okay what is actually the velocity of my bullet at this point so i can calculate the damage for example that's where you would use those sort of status things because you don't want the system to do something you want to get information from the system and it would still be uh, the sort of exact same logic you would still tell the physical entity to do an action and this action in this case is just a status, which will just give back information. That's in generally how you interact with physical entities and how you create them. Uh, we will have some examples later, like how to use this stuff, uh, just so you know what the, this terminology means. The next thing is that obviously the scene also has a physical world, right, where all those objects live and are simulated. And sometimes you want to do something which is not specific to one object, but to all of them, right? So one typical example would be, a, would be an explosion. You have an explosion and it should touch all of the rigid bodies and all of the meshes and uh, the entities in the scene. So instead of going to one specific entity, you again go to the global system, which is in, in the GNF environment, and you go into the physical world. And in here, it is pretty much sort of the same system. You can, for example, use simulate explosion. You can put in parameters in here and it will simulate explosion with those parameters and it will affect all of the, the bodies in the scene. And the same goes, for example, a really important thing is probably also ray casting and ray tracing entities. So let's say you have a bullet and you want to know, oh, would that bullet even hit something in the physical scene right now? You can use those ray casts. That's generally how you can interact with the physical world. As I said, in the physical interface, you can also find all of the functions in here, like simulate explosion is also defined here. You can then again see what those things mean. So for example, we also have deformation. You can also, for example, just calculate explosion exposure. Like let's say you, you want to apply damage to an object based on the physical strength this object just got from that explosion. And it gives you the ability to calculate. So normally, if you want to find something, it's probably a good start to just look here for a specific function and you will already pretty much figure out most of the parts. So that's how you interact with physics. Then a next really important topic for game programming in CryEngine are areas. And generally those are just areas in the scene where logic can be triggered. So let's say something moves into that area, you want to do something. Those areas just give you that functionality. So let's say you have a player, you, you move to a door and you have a door which should just slide open automatically once you go near that door. I mean, one way would be to like constantly update the entity and check the position and like how near it is to it. But the other way would just be to use the area system and just take an area from the already existing object tab. We have, for example, in here a box. And this box entity now, as you can see, already gives you like this debug draw functionality where you can see where the box would be in game. You can obviously give it different width and length and height, and this area just will be used for triggering events. And this is also the really cool part about the areas in Cryngen are that you don't, you not only get the event when you hit, if you go into the area or leave it, you actually get events if you are close to it, if you are close to leaving it, if you're moving inside, and also the audio system, the area system is also used for having audio ambience. So like, let's say you walk into a cave or you walk into a specific environment where you want to have like different audio based on where you are. And this is where you can use the areas as well. So it's a nice system because it's connected to audio and to game logic in the same time. So you don't need to like separate them. So just to cover like the basic functionality for the areas, we have a sphere. It's just a sphere. It will check the position of the entity to that sphere. So if you move in, it, it will let you know. Same goes for the solid. The only relative part about the solid is that you can actually sort of model it in the scene. I think if you already uh, covered CryDesigner, then this should probably be nothing super special to you. It's just like a pretty much SketchUp system where you can sort of model your area. Like let's say you have a complex building and it should be pretty accurate. So you can just sort of rebuild that mesh from your building in the area to model how the game logic should interact with it. Then we also have shapes, which are just 
shapes. I mean, there's nothing really to it. You can just define sort of a shape in the scene and everything which moves into that shape. So let me delete those other things so it's more clear. You can see that there's like those uh, blue lines and we can also increase the height a little bit. So now you can also see that it actually also has a height, like it's a body in your scene, right? It's a shape. So this can also be used in cases where you just have a really large shape and you don't want to have like a huge box, which probably doesn't model your level really well, but the shape is just multiple positions combined in one thing. And they all go through the same logic. It's just different sort of calculations on how the area looks like. But in general, they all share the same functionality and the same values. So how to use them? One uh, part I want to cover as well real quick is that you can build your own FlowGraph nodes. In general, FlowGraph is our system for scripting logic in an entity. So you can sort of build scripted logic for this entity. So you don't need a programmer to like do all the work. Basic functionality can already be done in the sort of visual programming style. So for gameplay programmers, they can expose their own logic in FlowGraph. So for example, if your game has like, oh, we yeah, are add score is your own function, your own node from the game, so you can expose that to FlowGraph. So in general, FlowGraph nodes are pretty straightforward. They will make probably more sense uh, when you use the system more extensively, but in generally, they just define in and outputs. We will do this together later, so I'm not gonna, I just want to know you that what a FlowGraph node means. So the FlowGraph node just has in and outputs in here, it gives you parameters in here and gives you something else. So let's say, for example, since we already covered the entity, there are, for example, entity position nodes where you can just get a position from an entity in the scene or set a position for an entity in the scene. So instead of doing this manually through code, you can also do it through here. And we will later on create a flow graph node together to sort of give the designers the capability to also build logic in, in the scene. So then one important part is just making your life easier in game programming. So if you're in development, you probably need more values, more developer functionality exposed to your game, right? Like for example, you just want to tweak values. You have a player, you have a speed of your bullets, all those parameters in the game which need to be tweaked and changed. You can use console variables for those sort of things to set them in real time. So we have a console in here, it's under tools, advanced console. But we will also build that together later. I just want to, to tell you what the console is. So the console here just gives you information like what a normal console would do in programming or whatever. It just gives you information about the engine. And if you type in here some, something, you can already see, oh, there are like a lot of console variables exposed from the engine already. So for example, just a real quick example would be, there are already some examples from the entity system. So I can enable a SIVA, which is a variable which is exposed from code to the console where you can set values. You can set strings, you can set integers, and those values can be used to trigger specific logic in your game. So for example, what I did now, I just enabled a SIVA to show all of the entity names and bounding boxes of entities. And you don't need to get familiar with the engine exposed ones at all. They can help at times, but it's just a neat concept to know about because those console sievers or console variables can be exposed from your game. So for example, you could put the player speed on a sieva, and then the designer, the QA, anyone could just open the console in the game, in the sandbox, wherever he has that game, just changes the value of this variable and it will immediately take effect in the game. So it's a really neat concept for exposing things to the users, but it's also a really neat concept for exposing like debuggable stuff. So for example, if you if you have a problem in your game and you want to expose more sort of visual information, you could use a SIVA just to enable it and disable it in your game. So how, how do you create custom SIVAs? It is really straightforward. They can be registered at any point, but as we talked already about the game plugin, right? The game plugin in here has a initialize function and it would probably make sense at the beginning where your game is loaded to make the engine aware about all of the variables which you want to uh, use. So in here, this is something I just added. Uh, we will do this together later as well. It's just a macro, the engine exposes, it just register an integer, which is just a number, like it's just a non-floating point number. And this number, you can give it a name, you can set a default value, and you can give it a description. So this already exists in here. So if I type in GA my number, it's there. It also shows you the, the value directly in the console here. And that's just a really nice way to sort of expose logic to it. 
And this receiver, you, you obviously, as well as always in the engine, get an interface to this concept of a console variable returned when you register it. So you can use that receiver later on to set it again or get information. So for example, let's say at one specific point in your game, you want to know oh, what is actually the value of the movement speed of the player right now. You can just type in get receiver, and then you could just give it the name of your receiver, and you again get the receiver back from the system, right? So this just means that this console variable can be queried at any point in the game, and it can be used at any point, and it can be changed at any point, which makes it really powerful. The last step is debugging. This is just in general, so we are on the same page on how to debug the solution. So the solution was already generated. And if you're familiar with Visual Studio, you probably already know how to debug it. But in general, debugging just means to step into the logic, into the code. Like you have code line by line. And debugging just means that you can step through each instruction and see what those instructions are and what, it, what they do. So let's say you have a problem, the player doesn't jump when you press space. OK, what's the problem? It must be something in code, so you can start to debug it. So and generally, in here, just redo whatever I did here. And let's say we want to, at the beginning, we just want to set a breakpoint to our initialize. The breakpoint just means stop here when executing. So this breakpoint will stop the whole execution of the program and just will let you know about the program at that specific state of execution. So the gameplay initialize is probably one of the earliest functions which will be called in your game. So you can launch the project from here, and it will load the, the game, it will load the sandbox, it will do all the stuff so you can start to debug it immediately. So in here, you can just launch the project in editor, and boom, there you go. It's, you can now debug the game and figure everything out. You already have the call stack and all those things. I mean, I'm not going to go in detail. Just so you know, it's really easy to do this. You don't need to like remote attach it or something. It's just you can just start the whole thing directly from your C++ solution. Right, then you can obviously step and do like all the normal stuff you can do in Visual Studio. And that's also how you can uh, start the different projects. So you, we have here the game, as I already said. The game itself has all the files in here. It's just the solution, the project of your game. And then we have editor, game launcher, and game server. And those are just projects you can launch. So like the editor in here, I can just use it as my startup project, which means when I hit the button in Visual Studio, it will just launch this thing. So if I set it as a startup project, I tell it, OK, please open the editor. It will launch the editor, open. And you can start to play your game with having Visual Studio in the background doing all the debug options. One other interesting information is probably how do I put something into the log? Like probably every programmer already did this multiple times. Like there are different ways in different languages how you put some information into a log. We have our own very straightforward system. So there's a function called crylog. And crylog always, always means it will always log, whatever it is. Like even in release, it will log. And lock, crylog will just mean uh, just means it will just lock the information in development. So and this thing works exactly like printf. I don't know if people are familiar with how printf works, but in general this just works with printf. It's really nice to use. Like you can I don't know oh something happened and it will be printed into the console which we talked about here already, right? So you can already see your printed messages in the game directly. And it's also nice like if a customer or like someone a QAler has a problem in the game or there's a bug, you can just add locks to it. And he can just send you the log. And the log will always end up in the root of your project. So for example, you have assets, code, and you have also then a log file in here. So I think maybe the game SDK already has one. Yeah, there you can see the game SDK already has an editor.log file. And this editor.log file is just log information. So it, it also, <laughs> good that it crashed here, because I can actually show you that in the log, it also gives you stack trace and those sort of informations. I don't want to go to in too much detail. It's just nice to know where to go when you like have problems or want to expose your own information. So the next thing is you already saw that we draw sort of like splines or we draw shapes in this editor, although they are not meshes, right? Like they're just like highlighted options. And if I, for example, show this on the area box again, the area box is no mesh, right? It's just a concept of okay, it has a size, it's in the scene. It can be triggered. But you obviously want to see something in the level, because if you don't see the box, it will be really hard to like, m properly design the level. So here, this sort of debug drawing logic can be also done from game side. So it's really nice to, for example, if you prototype or you white box your game, and you're not, you don't have all the meshes yet, or you don't have all the functionality, you can already use that drawing functionality. And we will also go into detail later how to do this together, but I just want to know where to find it. So there's one specific thing in our global environment, which is called Aux Geom Renderer. 
And this renderer is just for you to draw this debug functionality in the scene. So it has functions like draw 2D label. So you can draw a 2D label on the screen. You have functions like draw a BB box, which is just like a box in the scene, right? And this stuff is really nice, not only for debugging, but it's just in generally nice to have this in your belt while developing. So you can test stuff or figure out problems with this much easier. I mean, that's pretty much it from the concept side. I hope you kind of got a concept of what the engine uses to build game logic in general. And we will start with some lessons now. All right, so the first thing will just be make sure that we all have a solution to work in and compile the project. So if in your engine folder, or wherever you have the rolling ball template, if you already have it, you go into your engine root, which is located under the CryEngine launcher. You can also do it over the launcher if you have it open. So we can create a new project here, for example. If you don't have one yet, you can use the rolling ball here. If you have the launcher in here, you can just make a new project on the top here. Click on new. Now you see that the installed engine is 563, which we want to use. So you click on create project. Then it will open this project browser here. And in here you can see different examples, right? You can see like first person. But we want to click on rolling ball, give it a name, like I guess rolling ball makes sense. And in here we can create the project, click on create project. And yeah, it automatically launches the engine, which we uh, can use then. And if we go back to the launcher in here, you have now your project with the levels, right? You can open the level. And what we want to do is we want to jump to that location where this rolling ball template is on your hard disk. So if you're in the sandbox editor here with your project, you could, for example, I mean, just so you know that it works, you can go into here and open in File Explorer. So you specifically know where this project lives. And normally, the project will be under users, your documents, and then crunch and projects when you didn't change the path. And then you have your project there. So once you're in this folder here, so you see the game cry project file, you can right click it and get options. You can generate a solution. So once you press that button, it will launch up a window. It will just ask you which Visual Studio version you want to use. And you can just say, yeah, sure, I want to use that one. OK, wait, I already had one, but yeah. If you don't have one, then it will run through it. And we will get a new solutions folder in here. You can click in. And then you see game SLN, right, in general. Then close the editor again. We, we don't need the editor right now, because we will start the editor through the Visual Studio solution, just so, because that's normally how you would use the workflow. Yeah, so let's say you have now your game solution here. And this game solution has a solution explorer on the left in here, when you have the thing open. And I already showed that you can set up different projects to be your starting project. So just close everything down at the beginning. You just want to see the, those projects um, themselves. Right click here and set a startup project for the editor, because we want to start the editor. We don't care about the launcher. And then it will have like bold font for this project. Now we set up our solution. This is where we will program all the game logic. And the last step is that we need to actually compile it once, right? So compilation is just a step you do while like programming. It will put the code, the text, into like an actual thing which a computer can understand. That's pretty much what compiling does. So in order to do that, you go up here in the solution. You have your solution window. There's one option called build. You can click it, and then you have multiple options. For you, you just want to click build solution. So you click that one, and then it should pop up a window, and it should start to go through files and like spits out text, which we don't care right now about, right? So for you, most likely, it will say only the last line is really important. It will say build 6 succeeded. Now this means that we can technically start the game, which we programmed here. It was all successfully built into one DLL, and we can now start the project up and look it up in the sandbox. Great. Now everyone has a project which compiled. It's a great start. The next step would be just for you to know the workflow is up here, there's a local Windows debugger button. It's just in order to start the project. So if you click it, it should already start the familiar CryEngine launcher setup. So you go up to here and click it. Then it will like open the sandbox. But it also helps to close down all the other instances of your editor. And generally, it makes it easier to close all the other instances of the editor open, because the editor will be like, oh, yeah, there are multiple editors, and we'll just complain. In general, we will always start the, the game over this, so yeah. OK, so the next step will be just to open the level and actually test the game template. Uh, we go in our asset browser, levels, and in here we have the example level, so the root asset folder in here, then levels, then open the example level. 
And then here you see some entities uh, already preset in the scene. If you press into play mode, you can already play around a little bit, uh, see how it behaves, what you can do in the level. Okay, so now uh, the game works pretty simple. So if you're in the level, you can press uh, Control G or you press this button up here and the ball will always spawn near the camera. So wherever you are with the camera in the scene, it will always spawn near the camera. So if you move, for example, closer to those things, it will fall down there. And you can also see with W W A S D you can move it around and with space you can jump and you can already see that you can interact with the physical world in here. Oh yeah, in case you kind of got lost with the camera in the scene, I guess the easiest thing is just to go into a level explorer and double click an object because it will always focus the camera back to this object. So let's say you move with the rolling ball somewhere far off and you don't know where the scene anymore, it's just double click anything in the level explorer and it will move you in there. The first step will be just to quickly explain how to add files to Visual Studio, like just how to, to use Visual Studio real quick and then we will actually start to manipulate the game. Now we check that everything works, you can actually close the editor again. You don't need to make the changes to the level, just hit the X button at, on the top of the editor and close the editor so you're back just to the solution. When you have the solution here, we can click open the game project in here. And you can already see there are like files showing up in here. And yeah, we can start to program now pretty much. So just open this, pro this uh, under projects game, open it so you can see different files. You can double click files in here and they open up in your view here. Double click any file on the solution explorer here, double click it and it will open up in here. You can now scroll through it like it's a text editor, it's not that special. So I think the first step we will actually do is we will head to our game plugin CPP file. So under the project game, game plugin CPP, open it. And here you can see a lot of code. We don't care about that much. The first step we want to do is we want to change the code to actually make, a, make something in the game. The first step would be to register SIVA because it's really easy, it's just one line and we can already play around with values. So the easiest thing would be to go into the CPP. You can see those are functions. And there's one function called initialize. It's in line 34, most likely for everyone. And there's already like, it looks probably like this for you. There's just like one function call in there. And we want to add logic to this now, because what we want to do, as I said, we want to register a SIVA to the engine and we need to let the engine know that the SIVA exists. So in order to do this, I will just put it in here so you can see the code. I mean, you can just retype this code. That means that you tell the engine register an integer and it should have a name, a default value. You can take VF sheet, I will explain it later and use the description. Our initialize function, as I said, will be called at the beginning of the game. And we want to, at the beginning of the game, obviously create the SIVA. Don't wonder if there's already like, it says something like, oh, missing. We just want to have this line here already. I don't want, like if Visual Studio is complaining now because we're not completely done yet, obviously, but don't, like, don't mind Visual Studio. Uh, most likely this part will be red for you or will like complain about it, right? Don't, don't worry right now. There's one part which we still need to do. So yeah, I will go over again what this actually means. So this part here is a macro for telling the engine what should be registered. The first parameter here is the name. I just called it GA well, because that's our convention for naming stuff. Like it always has like two prefix numbers, but you can have any string in here, technically speaking. It's just the name of it. Then it needs a value for, for it because it needs some sort of default value. An integer is always a number, right? So you need to provide a number. In this case, one. Then this enum is just an enumeration of different like properties. And this enum just means that it's a cheat sieve, which means that when you build a game, and you want to ship it to the final user, he cannot use the sieve because it's a cheat, right? You just want to not have the user like just go into the console, change his damage or those sort of things. And the last one is just a description. So in case you expose the sieve, you can explain what the sieve does. Okay, so now most likely this is red for everyone. And that's because we still need to include a header from the engine in order to use it. So you can go up to the file. There are already a lot of includes here. Just scroll up to the file to line one. You already have a lot of includes and you can see that there is one include, this one, which we need because we want to do console registration. 
it's under cry system. The system itself has like all the basic functionality and you just add include cry system console registration. Uh, once you type this through and it doesn't complain about anything, it should also then highlight this thing as not read. <laughs> now that we got that, we can use the new Siva, which we registered, because once the engine registered that Siva, it will give us back a pointer. I mean, I, I'm not going to explain it specifically what a pointer now is, but it's just a reference to that object, sort of. And with this reference, you can now do something with it. So the next line would be p my siva, and we can actually do stuff with it. So you use the pointer accessor, and you can, for example, just call set and set a number in here. So what this does, it takes the siva you created as an integer, and it sets a new value to that siva. And now you can build the solution again. Go build, build solution. And now it hopefully compiles if you didn't do any mistakes. Once you got that, it compiled, everything's fine. You can start the project again by clicking on local Windows debugger here again on the top button and it starts the sandbox again. So now everyone has the sandbox open and now we can go to the console because we registered our own variable now. We can go to the console which is under tools, advanced, console. And then here you can just type in stuff. So it's called GA my number. Once you typed it in, it should pop up in here and it also should tell you the number which you added in the code, right? Okay, it's a console, so you type in the name and then you can type in any sort of different number after it and then hit enter. And it automatically applies this new number to the variable. So just type in your variable underscore my number and then give it a random number, whatever you want. The next step will be to actually use the SIVA now in the game code to do something with it, because right now it is pointless. It just exists, but there's no logic connected to it. We can close the sandbox again, because we want to program again. And the next step will be to go into the project game components player CPP. So just open this file and scroll to the very bottom. And there's one function called remote request jump on server. So now what we want to do is we want to use our Siva, which we registered, and we want to make it decide the impulse of our jump move. So when we change the receiver, we jump higher or uh, lower. So in order to do this, the first thing is we want to get our receiver again. So you do gn, and you want to ask the console for the value of this console variable. So you get get receiver, and you just put in there ga, my number, and that's it. You can also copy paste the name from above if you feel like from the game plugin. This tells the console to give us the Siva, and we also want to assign it to somewhere, right? Because we just we need to save this information somewhere, so we get Siva and do it like this. So we tell the console, give us the, the Siva and assign it to this variable here in this function. Okay, now that we have the Siva, the Siva is now just the interface to this console variable. We want to actually get the integer value of what is in the console variable. So what we need to do is call the Siva, and we already called set on the Siva before, so what we now can do is we can get, and now we need to bear with me, get e64 value and assign it to an integer. Because now we get from that Siva, we actually get the console variable, get the actual integer value, and you can then later on use that variable. Okay, so now the next step would just be to take this value and we can probably just feed it in here. So what you take is you take the value what we got from the p siva get value in here and add it to the impulse because we want to say that the z axis of the vector, which is up, should be the specific value. So yeah, so in here we just use the value and we put it into the vector. And now we save the file and we can try to compile the solution again. Okay, most likely it will also tell you about this part here, right? That it complains about uh, conversions. But it's not a problem, we just need to change the int to 64. Yeah, I mean, if you're a programmer, you probably know what those sort of things mean. I'm not going to go over it in detail. I mean, normally, you can also set the project up to not care about the warnings. Right, and what you need to do in here, because now we have an integer value, but the vector can also be floating points, right? So what you need to do is you just type in float like this. So now we, we assigned that value from the console variable to the action which physics will now take in to calculate the impulse. And what we now can do, we can start the project again. We can go to the console and you can type in your number again, my number, and give it the original value, 800, just to like, not completely ruin the simulation. And once you've done this, 
you open the level again, you can then jump into the game, press space and see what happens. And now you can play around with that console variable. You can start to make 8,000. And now we were like, Wee! yeah. And that's pretty much how you can use the console variables, right? So we just did small adjustments in the code mm, and we already have impact in our game. So I hope everyone got balls flying around. <laughs> This is a really easy way to modify the logic in your game with Sivas exposing console. You also kind of know now how to change the code in the project itself. So you know like, okay, if I go to a file, I type something, I can compile it, launch the engine, and it will use the apply changes. So I think we covered the first lesson set, which was just modifying the jump with the Siva. Next part will be a little bit more complicated. What we want to do now, we want to write our own component. We want to build it from scratch, right? We want to build our own logic. We want to like add it to areas. And in the end, what I want is that if you roll into the area, for example, with the that's will, that will be our goal for the next time, that if you jump into the game and you roll near those boxes, there should be an explosion and they should fly away. That's what we will build next. You can close the sandbox again because we checked that everything works. We can go back to our solution in here. And now we actually need to start adding new files. We want to add our new component. So the easiest step to do this is to click on the spawn point component header, spawn point .h, and it should pop up in here. And you can right click on it and go open containing folder. If you go to the tab of the spawn point .h, open containing folder, and there you have the actual CPP files. Those are the actual source files on your disk, right? So you know where the code actually lives. And as a good programmer, we all used to copy pasting stuff. So in general, I would say it's easy to take the already existing components, copy them and adjust them to what you need because everything from scratch, like you need to know exactly how everything works and it makes it just harder. So what you can do is you just take those two files, copy them, right? Copy and paste them again and then rename them to, I don't know, a custom component or something. So I already have this file in here. So I already did this for the presentation. So it's just call it custom component. But obviously those files won't show up in the solution now because you just copied files on the disk. Visual Studio doesn't care what you do on disk. It just it needs to know about those things. So since we use CMake, CMake is a build system. It lets you generate a solution and build the project. So what we need to do is we need to tell the system, oh, we have two new files. We need to add them to the solution. So what you do is you go again back to the solution explorer in your Visual Studio solution, go to CMake list, double click it again, and now this describes how the project should look like, like how it should be generated, how the build stuff should be generated. And what you can do in here, you can now add a new line with custom component CPP and custom component .h. Just add them to the components uber CPP stuff here. And what you do with it is just tell the CMake tool to include those files into your solution. Just add those two includes. They also need to be the same path, right? They are in the components folder because we just copied them. But now we just added the CMake file. We actually need to tell the CMake to give us a solution so we can work with it. So we already did the generating part. And once you generated the solution, you don't need to do this again all the times when you change the CMake file. You can just click build and it will automatically rerun CMake and add those files to the solution. And now Visual Studio noticed, oh, okay, there are new files because you added them in CMake, right? And it just says like, please reload. And you just say, okay, reload all because you, the project's changed. So next step here is to reload all. Then Visual Studio will do some stuff. Shouldn't take too long. And now you should see your own new files in the components tree in here. I mean, obviously the build won't succeed now because the files, we haven't changed it, but the CMake solution generation still happened, right? And you see those files in there. Okay, make sure that the CMake stuff looks similar for you and actually make sure that the file exists in that location. If some people have the problem that Visual Studio is picky, then just close Visual Studio, go back to the game SNL file and open it again. So yeah, the next step, as I said, is we want to actually write our own component. So as I said, it would be great if you could rebuild what I have here. I still want to like, redo the process for everyone. What you want to do is you want to change the name of this class to something of your own, right? We still want to inherit from the identity component because that's the interface we get from the engine. You can actually remove those two, they're not needed. Then we remove this function because we also don't want to have this function. We want to write our own functions. Then you change in the reflection type, 
we want to change it to also custom component because that's the custom component we want to reflect. Then, and this is the crucial part here, we need to give it a new GUI. We need to give the component a new GUI because this is a new type of component, right? It's not the spawn component, and that's why we need a new GUI. You can make up your own GUI, which I don't recommend. The easiest way is to generate your own GUI. And this can be done through tools. Create GUI, and then you get this tool. And you can select, I think, the registry format is what we want. You can click on new GUI, which will randomly generate you a new global identifier. As you can see here in the result, you copy this part. So click copy. You can minimize it again. You select the part inside, inside the quotes and replace it with the new GUI you generated. What this does is it gives you a new identifier for this type. And now this type can be always identified with this GUI. And it can also be saved to disk. So that's the important step. The rest here can, is up to you. You can call it game, custom component. So I will go back to my file so you can just do the same thing I did, I guess. So this is how it looks like for me. So I will actually delete them because they're not necessary. So yeah, really important is just that, it, that you change the GUI here so it's a new GUI because otherwise they will clash, right? If you just copy the GUI, it will just be the same thing. And then you can just edit your own. I will go through what it exactly means in detail. In order to get the starting point, it's a little bit of boilerplate, but it's not too bad. Like once you know it, it's just like just typing it down. So now that we have our header here, we also want to obviously change the CPP file where the actual implementation of this stuff lives. The probably the CPP file most likely looks something like this. So there's just one function in here, which is a registry function. And the only thing which needs to be done here is to rename this part to whatever you want to, like register custom component, right? And this function then will be put in here into this registry macro. And you also change the name of the actual component you want to register here. So it look like something like this in the CPP file. So just change the register spawn point function to register custom component and change the component in here itself. And then in the macro, you also change it to this part, right? So now we have all the stuff changed in our CPP file, right? Now it will be actually registered. The only thing is we need to implement the functions which we override from here. So in order to do this, uh, actually, I can just remove my part here real quick. Most likely, there will be like a green underlying thing under the function like this. And you can just, for ease of use, Right click on the functions, create quick actions, and then there's a create implementation function. OK, so after you created your implementations like this for both functions, because both will probably be highlighted, you just go like this, create implementation, and it will spawn a new empty one. And you just leave it like that. And for the get event mask function, unfortunately, Visual Studio is not smart enough to figure it out. We can just create an empty implementation of this, because we don't want to do this yet. Uh, we just want to have those functions in place. So yeah, so this is the final thing you need to add to your get event mask function, and then it should compile. So it should look like this. And now you should be able to compile the solution without warnings. If you didn't do this yet, you also need to obviously include the component include here, because before there was spawn point in here, you need to change it to custom component as well. So just hit, hit build again and build the solution. Build a solution. So we can now launch the editor. We can go into the level. You click on any entity in the scene, or you go to create object, empty entity in the scene. So this is the new entity now. It has nothing on it yet, right? It's empty. And now if you click on add component here, you should be able to search for the name of your component or find it in the category where it exists. So for example, for me, it's my component. I can click on it, and now it should appear in the entity itself. Obviously, nothing happened yet because the component has no logic right now. But in general, that's how you, you can create. So This is not provided by the engine. This was now provided by your game DLL. We know that our custom c component actually w was registered properly, and then we can now add logic to it. So I already added some parts for reflection. So we have a value of this class. So this component has its own value which is this M value. It's a floating point in here. And this float can now be a part of this component. So if you reflect this member, then it knows that this member exists in the sandbox, in the editor. 
and sh can show it in the property tree, right? So you should already be able, if you have this part, that you can uh, change this value to anything, right? You could type in some random values in here. And now this is a part of this component. So I just want to quickly cover how it works. So you, you, the add member function just expects from you a member from this component. So you give it a member. It expects some sort of random ID. And normally you can just take sort of like a character ID there. Then the next one is just the name, which should be written into the file. The next one is the name. Normally you can just do, this, do both the same. Like uh, there's no big difference. And then you have a description for this variable, so you get a tooltip when you hover over it, and then you can also expose the default value to the description. Now, what we can do is we can add logic to our component in general. So we have two functions in here, which we already overwritten. So those functions actually come from the iEntity component interface. They're provided by the engine, and you can overwrite them in order to receive logic from them. So if you go into the process event right now, yours is probably empty. And we can start to do something with the event in here. Let me copy this part because this is where we want to go. Don't want to show this yet. So what we want to add first is we just want to react on this event, right? It could be any event. It could be something happened. We just want to react to an event of this component. So what we can do is we can listen to, to the event. This is just the enumeration. If we go to the event, I, I showed this earlier. If we go to the e entity event, you can see that there are multiple events here exposed and we will use one of them. So if you go back to here, we just add a switch case and you can case onto a specific entity event. So you can, so what we want to, we want to react to initialize. And this time we want to lock some information into the console, something like that. And this is now the first time where this component actually does something. It's, it gets an event that the entity was initialized and it prints something into the console and says, yeah, here I am, I was actually initialized. And the last thing we need to add is we need to tell the entity that we actually are interested in this event because somehow the entity needs to know if you even care for this event or not. And in order to do this, you just return the event you're interested in here to the get event mask. So the event mask is just a mask to figure out what events the component and the entity should listen for, so we don't listen for everything all the time, which would be expensive to do. So what we want to do is we want to add update as the event we were listening for, do the cry lock, add something in the lock, and then we return the event we're listening for for this component. We can hit compile again, it should succeed, and then you can go back to the level, and now you see it in the console, it screams at you. And now you could do anything in the update, right? Like now you have the update call, you could move the entity, you could apply impulses, you could uh, change the camera, do whatever you want, whatever the engine gives you from the interfaces, you could be using it right there. So add the custom component to, your, to any entity in the scene, and now you can jump into the game. I would say we kind of wrap it up here. You kind of know now where to go further with the game programming. You can create your own project, you load it up, you change the components to your needs, you, you can react to events. So for example, in this case, in the update event, you would now do what sort of game logic you want to do. So for, you could move the entity, I showed you how the entity communication works. You could interact with physics, as I already shown, like call into the game world, create an explosion, those sort of things, right? We also have a community channel for the crime engine development and coding. So if you have, even if you have some question further, you can also contact people there. There's like a lively community talking about programming for CryEngine. Right, yeah, thanks.